Welcome to, um, to ODI. Uh, we're going to talk about financial sector uh, and growth, and we're going to do two things. Um, we're first going to talk about um, the, the launch, uh, the public launch of the call for research. Um, and we have uh, DFID and ESRC here to my left um, uh, to, uh, and right as well <laughs> to, um, uh, to discuss ab about the, the call for research. And secondly, the second part of, uh, of the meeting will be about uh, hearing uh, sort of experiences and insights from, uh, from current and, and, and past researchers under the program, um, so under the DFID ESRC growth research program. Let me just uh, briefly explain a little bit about uh, the DFID ESRC growth research uh, program, the DEGRP. Um, the DFID ESRC growth research program is a, a research program that, um, that funds high quality research and, uh, and DFID is the uh, sort of the, uh, the in initiator uh, of this and also the funder. And, uh, and in the ESRC is, uh, is, is the, the manager of, uh, of the research grants and, uh, and, and the manager uh, of, the, um, of the research call as, uh, as well. And then there's also the, um, the OCS Development Institute that, that helps with uh, coherent some of the messages and, uh, uh, and, uh, and also um, to, uh, to try and maximize uh, the impact of, uh, of the research on, uh, on policy. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a program. It's a, it has um, uh, funded research already. Um, so we, we've already had two research calls. Um, and um, it's, it has three themes. So it's, it's, it's agriculture, it's innovation, and it's on, on finance. Um, and uh, uh, in particularly in the first two calls, there were, I don't know how much you're going to talk about it in a minute, but uh, we, there were quite a few uh, research projects that have already been funded in the area of agriculture and, uh, uh, and, and innovation um, and growth, but much fewer uh, uh, research uh, grants have been funded in the area of financial sector uh, development. And we're very pleased that, uh, that uh, the ESRC and DFID have decided to, uh, to focus um, uh, this third call uh, specifically on, uh, on finance. And, uh, and it's an important area, of course, um, for, for development. Uh, it's, it's, uh, development isn't only about, uh, 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 about uh, social development. It's also about economic development uh, and, and environmental development as well, of course. Um, um, but in terms of economic development, it's, it's gone up to the, uh, to the forefront of policymakers, uh, including also in, in DFID, for example, on, on economic, uh, they've got a new director general for, uh, for economic development, but also more generally in, in, uh, in African countries. Um, there, there are uh, there's increased calls for uh, more work on uh, uh, and further attention to economic development. Um, under the area of finance, um, uh, we we've, we've uh, the program has funded uh, around three uh, research grants in the first round and around five in the second round, and um, um, and and they, these basically fall into two areas. Um, the first area uh, is, is in the area of microfinance, and so um, it, uh, th there was this idea that, uh, first of all, that microfinance was the silver bullet uh, for development, uh, so 10, 15 years ago, and then there was sort of a backlash against this, thinking that, that actually uh, microfinance doesn't work, and now there's much more research going on into, into finding out uh, empir empirically what are the best ways to, to provide microfinance? What are the sort of the best complementary policies to provide it? And there's a, there are a range of, uh, of research, co uh, research projects that work, on, uh, work in this area. And you can check our website, the DEGRP website, to uh, uh, the, uh, the details of, 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 of these projects. And then there's the second area of, um, of, uh, of finance uh, uh, and growth is, is more around sort of the, the macro lit literature, uh, regulation, so financial regulation for um, uh, for uh, uh, financial stability, for, uh, for, for economic growth, for inclusive growth, for equity. Um, um, and um, and, and there, are, there are a couple of calls um, uh, that have been, been put out in this area, and a number of projects have been funded in this area. Um, so far, we, uh, our um, uh, the evidence and policy group um, that ODI is leading here, to, uh, at, uh, uh, here um, We've done an, a, a range of, uh, uh, of things, activities to to help maximise the impact of um, uh, of the work so far, um, and in particular, uh, we, we've uh, commissioned a paper 
um, to work on uh, or to think about um, the importance of finance for development, a research agenda. So it's a paper by Thorsten Beck, for example. Um, and you can download that from the, uh, from the, from the website. Um, and we've also done a range of, um, uh, uh, of activities. Um, uh, we published a set of essays, for example, on sustaining growth and structural transformation in Africa. How can a stable and efficient financial sector help? And this was work uh, jointly with Stephanie Griffith-Jones, uh, who, who is also here in the, um, the audience. Um, and since then, um, um, there have been sort of more involvement uh, of, uh, of the areas of, 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 of research. And we'll, uh, we'll actually uh, hear on, on, on those in a minute. Um, so um, without much uh, further ado, um, I think I should just introduce um, the, uh, the, the first uh, two to three speakers um, for the first part of the, um, of the call, um, uh, or the first part of the meeting. Um, and the first part of the meeting will, will discuss uh, the scope and objectives of the research call. And um, leading us off will be uh, John Piper, who is, uh, who is uh, uh, taking the place of uh, St St Stephen Lee. But John Piper has been uh, also instrumental uh, in the last few years, uh, well, at least I think the last four years, in, in, um, in, uh, in bringing forward the, the research agenda within DFID um, and, um, and scoping out research, uh, uh, thinking about consultations, about what should be in the, in the research call, and, uh, uh, and, and it's worked tirelessly on uh, on, on, on beating the drum for, for the importance of research in DFID. So we're very pleased that, that he is here uh, to, to explain about uh, the interest that DFID has in this particular research call. Um, and that will then be followed, uh, the presentation will then be followed by, uh, by a joint presentation by the ESRC. And so Craig uh, Bartley, who leads on the international uh, uh, development portfolio within the ESRC, and he will explain about the importance that the ESRC attaches to development research and then we also go to nuts and bolts of, uh, of, of, of how it actually works in terms of applying for research and what it is that you can apply for. Um, and, um, uh, and so we will also be looking forward to hearing from that. And then after that, we'll, um, we'll then swap uh, places with, um, with, uh, with uh, the researchers uh, who have already done work in this area. But let us start now first with um, John Piper, uh, sorry, senior economist in, uh, in DFID in the growth research. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, just to, just to um, reiterate what uh, Dirk has, uh, has said, um, DFID is increasingly taking um, research and evidence um, the, or, or recognizing the importance of research and evidence in, in its policy making. And certainly over the last, as Dirk said, last four or five years, um, we've been putting much more emphasis on supporting research such as this to guide, guide policy making. So that's, I think that's the first important thing to, to, to make. And, and the reason that we're supporting programs like this, and, and uh, we've got a number of other programs. Now, in terms of economic growth, again, um, this is something that, 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 that has uh, risen in terms of the, the importance um, within DFID, certainly in the, in the policy agenda, and uh, on the research agenda to, to, to feed into that. And uh, um, we're increasingly putting resources working with um, ESRC and other players to, to, to take forward that um, research agenda. I'm particularly interested in um, thinking about the low-income country to middle-income country transition. Okay, what are, what are, the, what are the research issues? And, and particularly thinking about the financial um, sector development. What are the issues that enable that transition or facilitate that transition? Um, uh, thinking about you know that structural transformation, transformatory, uh, formatory growth um, that leads into that permanent transition. So that's that's very much on on the agenda within DFID, and will be increasingly so, I would say, over the next um, few years. So thinking around the uh, the, the financial sector, um, you know, issues around politics, issues around institutions um, are increasingly important. They may create may not, but they might create pathways which are difficult and, and hard to move, move from. So it, it might be important to understand um, what are the key factors ar around um, that development. Um, as Dirk's talked about, there's lots of evidence around micro-enterprises, -enter um, but often they don't grow in size. Why is that? Are there constraints there? Um, if we're thinking about um, 
medium size in enterprises again. How can they be stimulated to grow and create jobs uh, and wealth in, in, in developing countries? What role for the, for the financial sector? And I think also an interesting um, uh, debate that's going on within, within DFID around the issue of returnable capital, okay, equity stakes and loans um, into financial institutions, development banks. Okay, I think there's a need for more evidence um, on that, what works and what doesn't in terms of, you know, policy making. Um, I think in terms of the, in terms of putting together um, this research call, I would just, just highlight um, one of the uh, annexes that is, that is available on, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the website. And this is, it, it highlights 10 research questions which came out of internal in, in discussions within DFID. Um, and issues that are of, of, of importance and policy relevance for us, and, and Craig going to talk about that. That there are, you know, there, there's mechanisms for for looking to address some of those some of those issues. But just taking through the looking through the three sort of broad areas that are uh, of in, interest. Okay, so the first um, first area that we're interested in is the international capital flows, both private and public. What role do they play in, uh, in low-income countries' domestic financial development? Thinking about portfolio investment or maybe um, cross-border um, cross remittances, foreign direct investments, getting much more understanding about the, the evidence base in, in low-income countries. And again, you know, what role does uh, development finance or official um, international uh, development finance play in that? in terms of um, the development banks. And, uh, you know, what are the, how, how do um, the interactions of these help to shape um, the financial system in, in low-income countries? Because that's the first broad area that, I, that, um, that uh, we're interested in knowing about. The second uh, broad area is around um, the institu institutional framework that in supports um, inclusive financial development. Um, so uh, thinking about you know, the relevant theoretical models um, in, in support of that, um, you know, how low-income country institutions um, develop uh, and maybe interact in the context of um, state fragility, for exa example. And, and the last area really is around the, the um, technologies, new technologies, okay? What role do they have in developing um, new financial, uh, developing the financial sector? Um, there may be innovation, innovative case studies of where, where that's taken place and, and new thinking that, uh, that, that needs, to, needs to develop. So just to, just to, 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 to finish off, just and, and to, to, to emphasize, um, you know, this is a great opportunity um, to influence policy making in, 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 in DFID. There is a real interest in um, knowledge and uh, new research in this area, particularly and emphasizing, particularly thinking about low income countries. Okay? So there's more evidence based on middle income countries, less on low income countries. Can we expand that um, evidence base um, to, to assist? that transition, if you like. That's probably where we're, we're looking to, to focus. Okay, thank you. Okay, John, thank you very much. So you've pointed us to um, the importance of, uh, of, of, of this research within, uh, within DFID, and you pointed to uh, sort of um, uh, the, the three areas, uh, the three bullet points that, that are also being mm -hmm. mentioned in the, uh, in the document that you can download from the ESRC uh, uh, website. Um, so on, on the role of international capital flows and on, on institutional frameworks to support inclusive financial development, and how can the financial system in low-income countries be a catalyst and channel for technological diffusion? Um, and underlying this are sort of ten particular uh, questions that DFID are, uh, are are interested in, and it's also well worth uh, checking those questions out um, when you, uh, even when you prepare um, for bidding for this. Um, Maybe we should now turn to um, to uh, the ESRC and Craig in, in particular, so that you can introduce the the mechanics uh, uh, of of this, so how you can apply. 
for, for this uh, particular research. Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to start um, briefly by taking a, a, a slight step back and, and talking about um, how the ESRC um, looks at its, its collaboration with DFID and, and what we see as sort of the value in that as an overall partnership, because I think that very much um, leads into how we've structured this particular call the way that we have um, and why it looks the way it does. Uh, then I'll go in, into some of those particulars um, before passing over to, to Pecha to, to run through some of the mechanics. At a very high level, not to, there's going to be a, a subsequent webinar, I believe, that's going to go through the fine detail of, of what to click when. Um, but this is to just give pen potential applicants a, re a, a fairly good sense of what is involved in, in submitting a proposal so that you can make sure that you, you adequate allocate sufficient um, time and, re and resource to it um, to put in a, a, a good quality proposal. Right. So ESRC, first of all, I mean, we are not a, an aid agency. We are not a development funder. The ESRC's remit is to fund social, excellent social science research um, in the public interest. But we have been working with DFID for 10 years now. Um, and the reason why we've been working with, with DFID for so long um, and in, in an expanding portfolio of activity is that we see real value in, in by working together, it enables us to deliver on both of our objectives um, more fully than we could alone. I mean, I think this, this call in the growth program illustrates that, in that, you know, we are fundamentally interested in social science excellence, but we are also fundamentally interested in ensuring that research delivers real impact. Um, and that can be a real challenge. I mean, I think the, the impact agenda is something that the UK academic com community is increasingly familiar with. Um, it is still often debated, um, but I think the international development sphere is an area where we can really demonstrate the sort of synergistic values here in that um, by focusing research on addressing some of the development challenges um, and some of the questions that John was talking about, we actually do drive better research and we see this in our programs. It drives more interdisciplinarity, it drives innovation. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to do the economics in low-income countries the same way you could do it with the OECD, with the the sorts of um, data sets available. We're hoping, you know, this call is going to drive innovation in some of those areas and in, in how you come up with answers to these questions. Um, so, but we need to we need to strike a balance because we're also aware that, you know, you, what you know your policy questions are aren't necessarily what the capability of the research community is is there to answer in terms of the development of conceptual frameworks, the availability of data, and that sort of, sort of thing. So in this call, we, we've tried to structure it in such a way that we essentially deliver the best of both worlds. Um, in that framing, I'll go back to the program as a whole. So DEGRP is a 20.9 million pound program. It's now up to a 25.4 million program because we have essentially merged two very related programs that we, we funded with, with John's team, one um, on China-Africa as well, and those are now being brought together and will be managed under one umbrella. Um, as I said, the call has been running since 2011 with these three themes, agriculture, innovation, and finance. And with the, the underspend from the first two calls, we, um, we realized that recognized that the key gap to fill was in, in the financial sector. Um, so, as John was mentioning, DFID did some, some thinking, um, some consultation that basically led to the three questions that he talked about um, and the ten specific questions under that. Um, so we, at the ESRC, looked at it. We, we sent it around to, to some of our academic community as well, and we've been thinking really um, quite substantially about what is the best way to ensure we get the strongest research capacity to address these types of issues. And we're very conscious that if we, if we just want to go into the specifics, um, 
we be, may be missing a trick. Uh, the ESRC always trusts in its community, um, and we, we know that some of the best ideas come out of things that we, we don't anticipate. That being said, you know, the value of, that we get from DFID being able to say, you know, th these are the key things, these answers to these questions are, are what's going to deliver real impact um, to our country offices on the ground is, is equally valuable. Um, so that's why this call has a sort of two component structure. Um, so the first component is basically a, a pretty standard large grant proposal steered into the three broad themes um, that have been mentioned. So on international capital flows, on institutional frameworks, um, and on technology. And we're essentially, with two million pounds, we figure any proposal should be able to cover at least two of those, um, preferably all three. Um, but we're looking for, a, you know, a, a pretty usual looking, with, with that's, that has the, the feel of a, a fairly standard ESRC kind of thematic steer. Um, we're looking for innovative, interesting work programs around those that are going to answer those sets of questions. Um, the second component is a bit different, which is th this is where we're looking for, once we've, once we've established the capacity and the capability um, by funding this, this major large grant, uh, we don't want to just leave it there. And we want to really continue to work with the investment and DFID and other stakeholders so that this delivers a capability that can quickly and responsively respond to a whole range of um, policy relevant issues that may arise and that we can real build a real capacity for, for co-production between the policy and the practitioner community and academics. Um, so the the point where the the ten questions sit is now you know that's something that should very much inform bids as the types of questions that we're looking to to answer. Um, if you can cover them in your main proposal, if that's something that you're very interested in and you think you've got got some techniques in place to cover, fantastic. Um, what we don't want is any kind of game playing of leave those off because they'll come back into the second component. The second component budget is a bit fixed in that, you know, more interesting questions I'm sure John and his colleagues can come up with. So if you cover off the specifics that they've come up with, great, that will strengthen a bid. Equally, it's not essential. We wouldn't want people to dilute the quality of their bids um, by trying to, to answer questions that are tangential to their main capacities. Um, but we are very much looking for teams that are willing um, and keen to continue to work with the funders over time to, to co-produce additional research outputs with stakeholders. Um, so that's my sort of framing of the, the concept of the call. And now Petya, I think, is going to just talk through some of the, the details of what the application process looks like. Can I talk about the call requirements and some of the application process that will highlight key key issues. So the first point is reiterating again what Craig talked about, that the academic scope is, that's the main aim of the GRP call three, so you need to address at least two of the three questions that are listed, overarching research questions in the call specification. And again, highlighting what Craig just talked about, the policy relevant questions, while we encourage you to incorporate them in, sorry, in your main proposal funding decisions would really be made on scientific excellence and high quality of your proposed program. Um, the second component, once the grant is established, is again bringing this evidence-based policy making gap. Um, you need to demonstrate in your application your commitment to working with international s stakeholders to develop this second component and also the capacity of the team to deliver this additional work. So once the grant is established, there will be an additional funding of up to 500,000 pounds for, um, for the second component. So other key requirements for the CO is uh, the proposals can be for an amount of between uh, one and a half million and two million pounds of full economic cost. Uh, the duration is really of one to four years, so the maximum duration. least 50% social science, and we also do strongly encourage 
interdisciplinary proposals within the social science, so not solely focusing on economics and finance, but including politics, anthropology, and different disciplines within your proposed program. Uh, again, the HRP Code 3 must focus on low-income countries. I've provided the link in there with the uh, DAC list of ODA recipients, where you can see in the first two columns are the lower low low-income countries, so your proposals must focus on those countries. If you are to include any middle-income countries, there should be direct relevance of the research to low-income countries. Uh, structure and organization of the proposed program, it, it is a larger investment, so we are really open to how you, how you structure your proposal. There must be one principal investigator where the grant will be hosted, but it's up to you to explain how, you, how your team will work. Uh, there is a requirement also for the call to hold the key stakeholder workshop at the beginning of, of the beginning of your program. And just to reiterate again that under the call there will be funding only available for one program at the end of the call. Uh, in the next slides, uh, slides will be made available afterwards. I've provided links to our call website, so really just go and refer to all the documents that are there. The main one is the call specification, where you see all the thematic focus, eligibility requirements, and also you can look at the JES guidance, which is runs through the application process of how you can submit your applications. All the relevant guidance is there, but if you have any questions, do email us and we'll get back to you uh, on the email listed there. Um, another key thing with our programs is really that ESRC DFID calls are open to UK as well as non-UK research institutions and institutions with demonstrable research capacity are eligible to apply. Just make sure if you're a non-UK institution that you register on our joint electronic submission system early in advance as this can take up to four weeks um, or so and all principal and co-investigators must be registered. You can email us as well if you have any questions, but do take time in advance to register on the system. Um, the next slide is really talking about your proposal. So you need to submit your main proposal, which is your um, through the joint electronic submission system. Uh, there are a couple of mandatory attachments which are listed over there. There are quite a few of them. Your main uh, proposal is really your just application and also your case for support, which for this program is up to 12 pages as, as it's a much bigger program. And I have listed all the other necessary mandatory attachments that you would need to complete. They're all listed in the um, just guidance for applicants on our website as well. Um, so all the information is there. Um, so this is really running through once you have submitted your proposal. Um, there are initial checks that we do in the ESRC office as the first stage, and the review process for this scheme is first it will go through an assessor pool where uh, applications will be assessed. Um, applicants will have an opportunity to respond to reviewer comments at this stage. Then they'll be going to panel members where decisions will be made. And for this program, also successful applicants, one or two, depending on the quality of them, there will be, there will be interviews as well um, before the final program is announced. This is our timetable. The deadline is 2nd of July, so you do make sure that you submit before 4 p.m. on the 2nd of July. Um, Around October time, after all the assessments have uh, passed, there will be an opportunity to respond to um, comments. Then decisions we are hoping to send around December time, and interviews will be in January time. Uh, grants will be commencing from March 2016. We will be holding another webinar, which is basically a web-based seminar we have done for other calls as well. So if you do want to register, and, I, and we will provide more guidance on the application process, we're holding it on the 10th of June. So if you just email our mailbox, diffit underscore growth at esrc.ac.uk with your name, we can then send you details so how you can attend. It's quite straightforward, and we'll just provide more guidance, and again, opportunity for questions and answers. And yeah, and last, just do get in touch. You can always call us or um, 
just send us an email at any time. And also the Jess help desk, which is really when you start submitting your application, you can call them with any technical problems you might have or any questions at this stage. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Petra. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, just to, to say um, is that we'll put all of these uh, PowerPoints yes. on, the, on, on the web. Um, so you will also see the, uh, the, the contact details uh, there. Um, so thank you very much um, to all of you for, for explaining uh, about the importance of, uh, of this research call and also the, um, <coughs> the importance that ESRC attached to, uh, to the quality of research. So that's very important to bear in mind, um, but also the impact. Um, so also it needs to have uh, needs, needs to demonstrate the ability uh, to uh, to have impact, um, and um, um, you can also um, uh, talk to, uh, uh, for example, Louis Shackson, who is the, the expert here on, on impact uh, and path, pathways to impact, and who is leading the DGRP uh, project here at uh, here at ODI. If you're uh, if you're uh, wanted to have a discussion on on on, on impact. Um, but also, you can probably also talk to the uh, to the ESRC and there, there are documents on the ESRC website, also the DOP website on, on impact. Um, but of course, don't forget about uh, the research quality. That 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 is of course still uh, extremely important for uh, <coughs> for a funding body like the ESRC. Um, okay, um, so um, uh, we now have the opportunity to to discuss this with uh, the, the key players uh, behind this. Uh, so the ESRC and and DFID and. Uh, um, we can talk about a number of, of things, you, questions you may have on, uh, uh, on on the substance of the call, um, a bit about the, um, the, the uh, maybe the, the mechanics of the call. We can also t talk about. So just to re-emphasize the the date. So there's a the, the deadline is the second of July uh, to to submit your proposals. But there's there's a web, web seminar a webinar on the 10th of June that's being offered. So those are important dates. To um, to to uh, to bear in mind, um, the ESRC are looking to uh, to fund one program, um, uh, and uh, um, so it's it's one program, one program only, and um, um, they are uh, trying to uh, wanted to fund um, research that um, that can answer at least two out of three questions in the budget provided, and then on top of that there is uh, space. Um, um, and, and I suppose the ESRC and DFID would be in contact with, with, with the successful candidate also on, on, on the next steps if, uh, for, for, for the, uh, answering the question to 10, 10, 10 questions or, um, that, that were being raised um, by, um, by, um, um, by John and, uh, and Craig as well. Um, and of course, I, I, mean, I would also say that the, sort of the, the three major bullet points and the, the 10 uh, policy questions also are, are, are very much related, um, of course, um, and I think that that's also very important to uh, to, to bear in mind. Okay, um, very good. Who would like to um, start asking some questions uh, on this uh, this particular call? Um, so we've got a gentleman here, and then a lady. Up. Okay. Yeah, just a quick question. Well, would you hold one second, and then you're because there are also online viewers. Uh, oh, yeah. Like Thank you. you. Um, just a quick question uh, to Craig, please. Um, you mentioned that you were looking for um, uh, research um, offers from um, the academic and uh, practitioner communities. Uh, can I ask, can you ask you to elaborate on what you mean by the practitioner community? Um, I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to check if you would include in that uh, let's say, individual consultants with practical financial sector experience, mm -hmm. or you're talking about banks, uh, about um, you know uh, non-bank institutions. Do you have a sort of a strict definition of, of, of that, please? Okay. So, I mean, do you want to uh, do you want to answer that? So that this particular question now, so maybe the sort of eligibility criteria. Yeah. I mean. I mean, we use the uh, the most generic term possible, actually, in our documentation, which is just research users. Um, so an individual consultant could be could be involved in a grant, um, either as a co-investigator or as classified as a consultant in terms of funding. Um, you know, and we're we're interested in encouraging you know, um, full collaboration between researchers and anybody who is going to get value and use out of the research. Um, so. You know, while there, there are some 
technical considerations in terms of you know who we can provide funding to, and, and that's also uh, an issue for a lead research organization to consider. Mm -hmm. But in, in principle, um, we don't necessarily rule anybody out. And who could be the lead research organization or the lead organization? So the lead organization would have to be. Um, a, an institution that is is eligible for ESRC funding, um, and there's a specific procedure that you need to go through um, that does take a bit of time. So if your lead organization isn't already um, eligible for ESRC funding, um, there would have to be a process at the end of the grant to establish eligibility. Yeah, is that all right? Okay, very good. Um, Emily. Thanks. I had two quick questions. One was to John, which was just to elaborate a little bit more on the technology side. Because um, at first I just thought about it as a sort of new platforms for finance. So I'm thinking mobile banking and sort of mm -hmm. technological mm -hmm. diffusion that way. And I guess the other way of thinking about it is sort of SMEs, innovation in SMEs and sort of financing new, the sort of uptake of new technologies. So to, what's the interest there? And then I had a second question, which is just the ESRC colleagues, which just, you've labeled this call as a sort of research center. And it, how different is that from the previous, I can't remember the, how they were called, but the ones that, is the grants, so is there a, when we're thinking about applications, what, what, how is it centered different from previous calls under the DEGRP? Okay, um, John? Okay, yeah, I'm a very quick answer to sort of say, I think both of those actually, I think, I think uh, uh, both those elements would be, would, would, would be of interest. Yeah, so it's about uh, financial technology as well yeah. as finance for technology. Right. So yeah. both, both, I think bullet point two is more about financial technology, I think, mm -hmm. and bullet point three is, is particularly mm -hmm. about sort of finance for, for, for the diffusion of technology. Um, okay, and the other question, Peter? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, the, we try to clarify the, the type of language used as much as possible, um, because DFID have their own set of terminology and ESRC has its own terminology. Um, sometimes it gets confusing what's a center, what's a program, what's a project. Um, Basically, you know, for two, the, the distinction here that matters is that, you know, for, for two million plus, um, there's going to need to be um, some strong management and appropriate management arrangements in it. So, um, you know, we, we just need to set out um, the structure by which, if there are, you know, assume probably multiple work packages in, how everything will be coordinated um, and what will be done to, to ensure that. Uh, individual activities within a large two million pound grant um, really do add up to sort of more than the sum of its parts. Um, so that's the, the, the sense of coordination that we, we imply by words like center. Yeah, so I suppose the um, sort of average size of, of, the, uh, of, of grants um, in call one and call two was about 400,000 around that, um, that mark, but this is substantially higher uh, than that. So it's, 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 it's one, between one, one and a half and two million. So that will give some indication of the difference. Very good. Okay, um, Stephen. Um, maybe you could wait for the microphone to, to get to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just going look through the, door, the call documents, um, a lot of emphasis on inclusive growth, but nothing about sustainability. Um, so I wondered from DFID's and the SSE's perspective, are you interested in defining inclusive growth to incorporate sustainability um, would or if not would you be interested in that as a possible theme for the second component or you're not interested in it at all okay uh, John <laughs> I think I think we are interested in sustainability I mean I think I think but but so I think that the, the focus, as as clearly says, is th around that inclusive growth element. Uh, you know, and I think that needs to be sustainable to be inclusive. If, if okay. you like. Yeah. Craig, you want yeah, to? Good answer. Yep. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I same view. So. Yeah, good. So there is clear interest yeah. in sustainability, but particularly the inclusive element mm -hmm. of um, okay. Uh, growth. Okay, uh, the gentleman on, on the right here. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are two questions which are a bit related. Uh, the first one, um, the three main questions or parts of the research bid, um, they are already parts of existing research, both within the ESRC and the DFID, which touch somehow tangentially 
you know, on those questions. And will this bid be construed as an extension of some of the ongoing work? That's question one. Secondly, it's true that some of the issues raised here are already a point of research by international organizations like the World Bank, IMF, and others. And how does it look like to you when you receive the bid when such a bid has already been funded at least in a small way, not in a major way, but in a small way by other international organizations? So those are the two questions. You want to? Um, I mean, I, I think that's, um, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, I, th I think that's um, a challenge for, for the bid preparation and, and actually a key thing that is very much looked at um, in the peer review process mm -hmm. is what we're looking for in a proposal um, is an argument that something is going to be done um, that builds on existing work but really brings something new um, innov and innovative. I mean, what we want to have confidence is that, you know, we're going to get in some form or another value for money, um, that things are going to happen because we put two million pounds into this investment that otherwise would not have happened. Um, and that's the key quest. So it, it's how do you situate your bid within that broader work of, of you know, mm -hmm. existing research um, that really demonstrates that this is going to take things substantially forward or to another level or, or um, in another direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe I can also add to that is, is that in, in, if you think about research on international capital flows, then there used to be a lot of research on this sort of in the 70s, 80s, so uh, thinking about the uh, Latin American debt crisis and, uh, uh, and the Asian crisis. Uh, but then, sort of uh, around the 2000, early 2000, there was very little actually. And then the financial crisis hit in, in 2008, 9. And then we realized, uh, as a development community, how little and how few researchers there actually were that, uh, in the area of, uh, of financial sector development. And so there was a real dearth of, of research in this area. It's now beginning to pick up, and I think that's uh, also thanks to bodies like the ESC and DFID, uh, that they have uh, increased their attention to, to more research on financial sector development, on international capital flows. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I think I would say that there, 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 there's some research ongoing, um, but, uh, but there's much more research in other areas like agriculture, innovation. There's, there's already much more ongoing than, than actually the area of financial, financial sector development. So that's, that's exactly why, why this grant is, is hoping to sort of uh, to, to, to get access to the best researchers available and, 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 uh, and, 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 and a sort of a group of researchers, a consortium of researchers um, to, to sort of rectify uh, s s some of the, the, the lack of attention to, to, uh, to the, these important issues like, uh, like international capital flows. I don't know whether you want to add anything no, I, to that. I mean, uh, just to, to reiterate, really, I, mean, I, I think, um, you know, the key thing is to show the value added, okay? Where, where are we adding um, with this proposal? And as Craig says, you know, it's quite substantial um, funding available, okay? The, then, then the, the offer's got to be quite substantial. But that doesn't mean to say that, you know, obviously you should be building on other work that's, that, that's going on, um, you know, that, that is out there and, and, and using that where, where appropriate. Yeah. I suppose a good start, um, if, I, if I may say, it would be to look at, uh, at the, the DGOP website and it's also to sort of see um, um, uh, what research is currently being funded um, by, um, by the DGOP already. And um, so you will be able to click through on, on the grants. And we'll hear in a minute from, uh, from three grants holders. Uh, but you would click on, on, on grants by uh, Stephanie or by uh, Svetlana Andrianova or, 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 and others who have already done research in, in some of these areas. Um, you will be able to sort of click on, on the paper from uh, Thorsten Beck um, and others. So sort of basically, you can see what the DOP, the DOP is already uh, funding. And so obviously they're looking for duplication of this particular aspect, these particular aspects, but you can build on this and, and of course we, uh, we would encourage um, sort of collaboration uh, amongst, amongst the various players. That would be really important. Does that answer your, your, uh, your two questions? Brilliant. Very good. Um, lady over there. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the um, um, commitment to working with uh, stakeholders and the kind of level of uh, involvement you were looking at with um, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You okay? Um, shall I take a few questions? Um, maybe when you think about it, maybe you can. Uh, uh, you, had, you had your hand up as well, Stephanie. Yes. Um, well, I have two questions. So, and you can think a bit about this, this particular question. Yeah, I, I had two questions. Uh, one was um, about methodology. Um, methodology. Um, and, I mean, is there some preference in terms of final use of particular methodologies? I mean, I've read the document quite carefully, but, uh, and there are some indications, but I was wondering if you, if you could be more specific, how much you prefer quantitative approaches, case study, theoretical reviews, or are you completely open? Um, and the second, I, I've listened carefully, including to Craig's uh, explanation about the link between the two million and the other half million. I'm not completely, completely clear how it plays, um, and I would be uh, grateful for a bit more explanation. Okay, let's take those. These are three questions. Um, so the first one is about stakeholders, uh, what are the expectations there, and how to liaise with stakeholders to achieve impact, for example, or other areas. Um, and then there, there's a question about methodology, what your expectations are on that. And, and, and maybe you could clarify again the, um, uh, the distinction between um, the one and a half to two million grants and then the 500,000 on top of that. Um, so it happens to be the case that the difference between one and a half and two is also 500,000, but I don't think the two are related. So, <laughs> so maybe you, you can just uh, clar clarify these, uh, these points. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of engagement with, with stakeholders, um, I suppose there's, there's two, um, two elements to it to consider. I mean, one where um, we're looking for proposals that have their own um, good links to stakeholder communities and that, that can actually bring some of those connections and networks um, and insight um, and to help you know policy communities work into the development of their bid um, so strong strong stakeholder con um, engagement that originates with the the team putting in the research is is going to be something that we're going to be looking at um, but secondly, you know, I think we are looking for a, a willingness and an appetite and a flexibility to, to engage with, with new communities and to take a bit of, of guidance from, from the funders, particularly in at DFID, to say, you know, once you're up and running, here's some, some areas or some people we would like you to, to start working with and seeing whether you can come up with projects that are done collaboratively that, that address a particular set of um, questions. And for the ideal bid, you know, that that's, it will be somebody that is probably in a position to say, oh yeah, that's, that's something we can do. We may not have exactly the right balance of expertise in our core team, but elsewhere in our institution or within our professional networks, we actually do have other people that we can also bring in. Um, that can address these sorts of things. Um, so that's what we meant by some of the thing about demonstrating the, the capability and the feasibility um, is for to receive projects that have a, a willingness and an ability to adapt to a bit of a, a changing landscape as well. Um, I mean, on methodological preferences, um, from the ESRC perspective, we don't really have um, methodological preferences. We have a bit of a rule of thumb that, you know, mixed methods, multiple methods tend to produce richer, more, more rounded pictures of, of phenomena. Um, but there are times when, you know, particular in individual work streams, perhaps within, within this, um, there may be strong scientific cases for sort of single methodological development. But um, so we have no hard and fast kind of preferences where we'd rank something on type of research. Um, it's the quality of the research, whatever type it happens to be. Um, and then so on the link, I mean, it's the, the 2 million and the 500,000, I think, a, a bit factors into to how I tried to answer the previous question in that, you know, 
the up to two million is for a pretty straight ESRC large grant proposal, um, you know, according to the spec. Then the 500,000, I mean, I think we haven't pinned it down specifically, I don't think, in terms of the timing of coming in with the, um, the additional activities, because I think it would depend, in a sense, on some of the issues in terms of demand. I mean, we might have something mm -hmm. quite quickly that comes up that's closely aligned to the particular successful bid. Um, but I'm thinking in a, in a four-year overall program, maybe somewhere six to 18 months in, it might be, okay, you know, or at the first annual meeting, let's start having some conversations about what the particular additional questions we could, we could start to pursue are. And, you know, there will be uh, an assessment process in the proposals of, of those as well, um, but provided we get a very strong coherent, we can say that, right, we can, we can top up the grant to this tune to, to do additional work. Just, just to add, I mean, yeah, again, in terms of uh, me methodologies, it, it, um, it's identified some in, 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 particularly in, the, in, in the annex. But again, I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules there. This is, I think this is for you as researchers to respond and sort of say, actually, this, 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 this would lend itself to this approach. This is the most appropriate approach to um, and I think, um, as, as Craig says, you know, we're looking for excellence in research. So as long as the case is made, I think that's, um, you know, th there's scope to, 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 to use mixed methods, I think, um, certainly in there. And just, just in, terms of, in terms of, yeah, the, 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 the you know, the, the, uh, the, the one and a half to two and the additional funding, I think I th this has probably come about from, from for, from our side in terms of you know we've had some consultations these are questions that have come up quite sharply within DFID okay well what what you know and, and they've been identified but we don't want to be prescriptive in terms of you know you responding to that so there's scope for you to, to, to pick up elements that you that, that, that you feel you can and elements that um, you know maybe not maybe not appropriate but Let's leave the flexibility to, to maybe so actually look, this is a burning issue and this is maybe something we want to pick up, up at a later date in the program. So that, 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 mm. that's, I think that's why it's there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also great to hear that David has such great interest in, 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 um, in, in this research and that there's a, there's a, there's a demand for, for, the, for this type of research which is very mm. much in, ingrained and uh, so you can see all the different types of questions. Um, so that, that I think is a very, a very uh, uh, healthy, healthy sign. Um, uh, which is very important. On the methodologies, I think that's, um, I mean, if you look at the, the past grants uh, or the current grants, and there are, there are about 35, 36 grants, there, there, are, there are a range of, uh, of methodologies are being used. Um, and I think the, I mean, the size of the grant is, uh, helps to sort of, uh, that you can be quite ambitious uh, in, in, in your, uh, your approach. Um, quite a few grants, particularly on the microfinance side, have. Have, um, uh, have have begun to generate their own data as well, and it's in some of the other areas uh, um, um, where there's a lack of data, in, in both in in the agriculture and, in, and innovation themes, uh, have to have to generate data, um, which which is always uh, important. But that's not of course uh, prescriptive. There are other other grants that that have uh, view secondary data or or use more of a, a case study approach to a very very uh, a range of methodologies. Um, Machiko. Uh, Hang on one second for the microphone. Sorry, apologies for interrupting. My question is about the interdisciplinary nature of research. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, mostly finance field, we are economists. Mm -hmm. How much this goal is asking beyond the usual economists and the finance people? I mean, I can understand other development studies and uh, other disciplines, politics, international relations, but uh, do you want us to go much more further interdisciplinary or it's just a usual requirement, uh, this sort of program to be inter interdisciplinary, particularly if it is, is very key interdisciplinary research. Is it uh, something this program particularly looking for pro uh, proposal which has beyond the usual finance economics uh, debate? Okay, thank you. 
Um, I've also had uh, two, uh, two questions and a comment from the online viewers. The first comment is that we need to speak more clearly into the microphone. So <laughs> <laughs> apologies to the online viewers, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and there are two, two other questions. So one is, question is, uh, will you encourage comparison between two countries, one LIC and another uh, uh, low, mid mi low middle income country? So would, would you encourage comparison between countries? Um, some of them could be LICs, others could not be LICs. Um, and the second question is, um, is there any preference for the length of the project? One to four years is a big range, so is there an expectation this would be on the longer or the shorter end? So, it's, I mean, are you fixed to a four-year period? Are you fixed to three, two, two years? What is your, uh, your view on that? Um, and uh, thirdly, would a grant application uh, from two institutions, a UK university and, an, and a LIC university, be more preferable? Uh, this gives us more access to data and capability. So would you, would you um, encourage joint, uh, joint bits uh, between universities? Okay, so there's a question on discipline, discipline disciplines, uh, a question on compar comparative research, um, a question on the length of the project, and uh, a question on, on uh, collab collaboration between universities in UK and abroad. For discipline, it's really we do encourage applicants, but it's up to your proposal and how you set it out. So we, it's not a set requirement that you need to do it. It's looked at case by case, but we do strongly encourage just bringing other disciplines as well. But it's depending on how you develop your proposal on this, I would say. Yeah. So there's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the. Um, the sort of at least 50% social science is a standard ESRC line, so yeah. I think it's potentially more relevant to other calls um, exactly. that are closer to sort of, it, it more in the main closer to perhaps a, a natural science or, or a mm. physical sciences um, interface when this one, I mean, I, I don't expect us to really having to scrutinize budgets um, because we're unsure of whether projects that we get submitted will be at least 50 percent social science. Um, but again, I mean, yeah, the, the interdisciplinarity, we tend to see, you know, higher quality in terms of more innovative projects in terms of being interdisciplinary, but it's also a risk then that things can fragment um, if you you push it too far beyond, and then you just have two separate things that are in different disciplines and don't really come together. So it really has to be, you know, driven from your best judgment in terms of what makes the strongest scientific case, how you strike that balance. Um, in terms of the other questions, I mean, I, I think we would be quite open to, to proposals that had a strong comparative dimension between low-income countries and low, and middle-income countries or lower middle-income countries. The thing I would, would emphasize there is that it's essential to demonstrate what the value is to low-income countries of making that comparison. I mean, John spoke earlier about um, you know, the importance of understanding that transition. So in terms of understanding that tr tr transition, I would think comparative research would be very important. Um, but what you don't want to do is have something that is mainly focused on middle-income countries and the dynamics of middle-income countries that just throws in a lower-income country or two to make up the numbers and try to be eligible. I mean, the, the scientific case really mm -hmm. should be um, centered around you know, the transition from low-income countries. Um, again, I think um, the extent to which that extends to an institutional collaboration, again, would be something that, you know, we would be positive about, would encourage, but again, assuming the, you know, the science drives that and it, and it is sensible. We, we, we are not tokenistic in, in any of these sorts mm -hmm. of arrangements. Um, we have found over the history of ESRC, DFID, um, funded programs that the strongest ones are ones with UK and Southern PIs and co-eyes. If something is just located within the UK with no so Southern, at least co-investigators, they are significantly less successful. So you know, the data in that, and that's not in trying to hit that as a quota, that's just in terms of, of peer review of the quality of the science itself. Um, 
So I would encourage it in that dimension. Um, yeah, length of project, I, mean, I, I would think three or four years would probably be more normal um, in terms of an adequate amount of time to spend two million pounds. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has, wants to add to any Yeah, no, I, I, I think not a great deal to add. I mean, I agree with your comments. Um, yeah, I think, I think a, a three, four years is, is going to be that sort of length of program, I would have thought. Um, and, and, uh, and, and as Craig says, you know, I, this sort of size of program, you would anticipate um, a number of different institutions linking up and working together on this, um, which would hit your sort of uh, disciplinary issue. And also the, um, you know, low-income country institution and um, developed country institution. So you would imagine a good, strong proposal would have those elements. Mm -hmm. And it's not tied to the UK. No. 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 Okay, that's uh, that's very clear answers to those questions. Um, lady over here. Um, could I just ask um, for you to expand a little bit on the expectations with regards to the research organisation su support? Perhaps, about, you know, how how you'll judge that from a one institution that perhaps isn't as capable of, you know large capacity um, infrastructure. Okay, so that's a, that's a question about uh, the assessment criteria, and in particular about RO uh, capacity. Maybe you, do you have the, 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 well the assessment criteria are listed in the document, but there's a specific question about the research organization capacity. Maybe you want to, PTR or? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, um, I mean, could you, Unpack that. I, I'm not sure ex exactly what you're. So sorry. Um, so obviously, depending on who you might collaborate with or the mm. um, the size of your institution, you might have more um, resources to contribute. So in terms of assessing the overall, you know, successful proposal, mm. you know, what you know, you've you've got a paragraph describing the support expected, but it doesn't go into yeah. any sort of tangible detail. Just wondering if you're able to expand on that at all. I think it's really supporting to host the grant because that's one of them supporting the networks for where the grant will be hosted. So we just want to have more information on this as well. And it's this is not the main attachment that assessors will be looking at, but this just provides more information on how the grant will be supporting, especially when it's a larger program, you would really need to ensure that there is the management support mm -hmm. for the for the program. So it's not so much about sort of building a capacity of new researchers or lecturers or PhD students, that sort of thing. It's just about the actual infrastructure of the institution to host to it. To be able to host the grant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one second. Just a short follow-up asking for clarification on, on that point. Uh, with, with some funding bodies, and particularly uh, e EU um, uh, research grants, I mean, uh, uh, and other types of EU grants, um, the investigators would be expected to bring in um, a specialist management company uh, to manage the network, manage the research mm -hmm. program on a purely managerial basis. Um, is that something that's, that's, uh, that, would, that can be envisaged in, this, in these types of frameworks? So I suppose that is a question about the lead organisation um, and, and eligibility of the lead organisation. I think um, sort of the, you may want to sort of clarify what uh, sort of the um, what types of organisations are eligible. Are management consultants or are they eligible? Uh, are you looking for universities? Are you looking for what what sort of organisations are eligible to lead? I mean, in in terms of the the management of the grant, um, I mean, I suppose there's there's a few things. I mean, the, in terms of assessing the proposal, we will simply be looking at, you know, are the management arrangements appropriate um, and effective to the type of the grant? You know, if you've got something that's based in one or two institutions um, in an existing center with, you know, it may be much more straightforward than if you're talking about a partnership with seven or eight institutions stretching across a couple of continents, you know, in that type of arrangement, I think we'd want to see a lot more and how you're going to make sure that it all sort of coheres. But, you know, anything sort of specific in terms of how you would deliver that is not something that we're going to predefine. We're just going to, yeah. to assess how good the proposals are. Um, I think I could clarify, you know, the, 
because the way ESRC awards grants is not the way all research councils do, um, is that it are, we have a contract with the single lead research organization. Um, and then in the terms of the contract, essentially, the relationships with any subsidiary organizations are in the main devolved to the responsibility of that lead organization. Um, so the lead university will be responsible for making sure that um, everything is do done correctly in any of its um, subsidiary organizations. Okay. All right. Um, we've still got scope for one or two questions before we move to the next phase. Are there any more questions on uh, either the substance of the call or uh, the specifics? And um, when you get into the detail, you probably uh, have more questions, but then there are sort of several opportunities. You can either speak to, to Petya uh, over the phone yeah. or you can uh, um, listen to the webinar that, that you're organizing on the 20th yeah. of June. Um, and there are other opportunities as well to, uh, to think this through. On the substance side, uh, the different interest in particular, I would urge you to ask the question, any, any questions you have now, or uh, I'm sure John will stay on, uh, so, so uh, for, to, to listen to the other grant holders, or to the grant holders in a minute, but otherwise you can, you can talk to him also afterwards. Um, uh, but if there are no more questions, then, then uh, I just want to make, uh, make sure we thank uh, Greg and, uh, and Petya and, uh, uh, and John for, uh, for explaining about this, uh, this very important uh, research call. Uh, and, uh, um, and so I think we're, uh, we've been getting much more wiser now. Now we know about uh, what is in the call and how we can apply. So I hope uh, all of you are now encouraged to, uh, to apply. So um, uh, let us uh, thank John and Greg and uh, Petya. Okay, um, so I'm going to ask um, um, uh, the, uh, so John, the second break, to, uh, you can now sit in the audience, and then we, uh, we, we then move to the second part of the, uh, uh, of the meeting, which is um, to hear from some existing grant holders who, um, who are already um, uh, uh, well away in a grant, may have finalized a grant, or, uh, or, or have just started a grant, and we'd like to hear from them how, how they have... Uh, how they have um, um, uh, structured their research, what their findings w uh, were, and um, and so we'll we have uh, uh, about 45 minutes to, to listen to them. So uh, maybe Svetlana and uh, Stephanie and Emily, maybe you could come to the front. Uh, they are uh, Professor Stephanie Griffith Jones, um, who is uh, the um, uh, Financial Markets Program Director at the in Initiative of, for Policy Dialogue at the Columbia University and is also an ODI associate. And um, uh, the second grant holder in Call One uh, was Dr. Sardana And Andranova, who is a reader in economics at the University of Leicester, sitting there on the left. Um, and uh, the third grant holder who couldn't be here is Professor Alison Brown. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to hear from her, uh, we've just recorded uh, so, uh, some videos um, uh, of, of an event that we've held in, uh, in Dar es Salaam a couple of weeks ago and uh, with the governor of the central bank, um, uh, Professor Nadulu, and, and a range of other stakeholders. So if you want to listen to her grant then you can, uh, or the findings of her, her grant, you can, uh, you can go to our website. Um, and then there are five grant holders in, uh, in, in the second call, um, and um, um, they're also listed on the website, but, but one of them is, um, um, is a team <coughs> led uh, from the, the University of Oxford, uh, Neri Butch and uh, Emily Jones, who are co-leading um, uh, uh, a grant. 
And so uh, we, we're looking forward to, to hearing from them. Uh, I've asked them to speak for about 10 minutes, maybe uh, a bit longer. Um, so we'll, we'll hear from three of them. And then after, after that, we've got um, some, some time to, uh, to ask questions um, uh, on, on their findings, on, on the way they've uh, structured their, their, um, their, their projects. Of course, we can expect there to be much more progress in, in, um, uh, in call one grant holders than grant two, uh, the grant two grant holder who, is just, uh, who has just started. OK, um, so I think we should just start with the first uh, grant holder, um, um, uh, Stephanie Griffith-Jones. And her project was on uh, uh, financial regulation and inclusive growth in uh, low-income countries. Um, so maybe um, if you'd like to sort of take some t about 10 minutes to, uh, to present your research. You've got a, a PowerPoint as well. Uh, here's the, uh, uh, thank you. over to you, Stephanie. Um, and speak in the microphone, please. Yeah. Yes. Well, I want to thank... Uh result in a, in a book that we're hoping to be published by Routledge. Uh, so the key issue that, that we were quite ambitiously looking at was how uh, finance can at the same time fund, help fund inclusive growth while preserving uh, financial stability. And starting to look at the first aspect and focusing on uh, credit creation, particularly by banks, which are so dominant in, in, in LICs, we focus really on three areas, uh, quantity, cost, and maturity. Um, and we particularly actually focused a lot on the cost of finance. Um, and I will talk more about that, because that is an area which we, we found, and particularly our, our LIC partners found, very crucial, and on which perhaps there has been insufficient research carried on. But starting with the issue of finance, um, it, seemed, it became very clear to me that, uh, and to the team uh, that more finance is needed in the low-income countries, that what is called deeper financial system, because the financial sector is relatively shallow and does not reach important segments sufficiently. I'll come back to that. Um, we had in the background of our minds the, the literature that emerged from the financial crisis, on which again the IMF has recently published a very interesting paper, uh, talking about the risk of a financial sector uh, to be uh, too big. But in overall, I would say on balance, this is not such a not a, such a relevant issue for low-income countries because uh, the size of the sector is well below the sector where there seems to be that danger of reversing the, tr the positive trend between financial growth and finance. But what is very relevant from all the literature coming out from, from previous crises is the need for credit not to grow too quickly. Because there is so much evidence, including in Africa, the only crisis that happened in the last decade, Nigeria, um, but very clearly worldwide, um, that, uh, that rapid credit growth practically always precedes and is a major factor causing crisis. So the issue is deepening, but, very, but gradually, so that you can do it in a steady way. Um, and, and I think this is a, a really important, uh, sounding very obvious if you're an academic, but less obvious if, if you're a policymaker in the middle of a boom because there is always this ten tendency to this time is different. So then we focus quite a lot on the cost of credit. Um, as I said, there's less research about it, uh, less discussion. And of course, it's particularly important for, uh, I, I would say, the middle sector, small and medium enterprises. Um, and the two problems that we found. One is that the spreads between deposits and lending rates are very high, in general in leaks, including in our case study countries. But secondly, and perhaps even more worrying, that they don't seem to fall through time. They don't seem to fall through time. 
uh, and, and there are exceptions, and we noticed towards the end of the project that Tanzania, for example, is an encouraging exception. It's a country where the spreads have, have decreased quite significantly. Overall, um, bank lending spreads are much higher in LICs than in middle-income countries and in high-income countries. They're about double um, what they are in, you can see this, sorry. I hope you can see it. They're double um, from in, in leaks than in mix. If you look at the last line, and they're practically three times um, um, what they are in, in, in high income countries. I thank Stephen Spratt, who's in the audience, who's one of the co investigators of the project. So I think this is, this is actually very striking. Um, and also, we can see that um, if you look at the last column there, um, that in the past, actually, spreads, this is slightly different uh, sources, but the, the spreads were actually lower than they are now for, for low-income countries. So this is, I think, a very worrying, a very worrying trend because it, it, it shows that, that we haven't made progress. And in our case study countries, um, the spread uh, goes from the lowest is um, in Ethiopia, and the highest is in Nigeria, uh, a full 15%. So this was a, a great cause for concern, and uh, um, also in, in, in Ghana, actually where it is somewhat lower, uh, there was quite a lot of concern in this. Um, so I think this is, uh, and, and we have historical series in, 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 our, uh, in our project. So then, what are the causes? Well, one explanation could be that the, for, for greater spreads is that there are greater risks. And yet when you look at the default losses, they're not particularly high. Uh, and if you look at profits, at profitability um, of banks, in, in, in the low-income countries. For example, the return on equity. The return on equity is actually far higher, that's the second line, in, again, in low-income countries than in the middle-income countries and in the high-income countries. So profitability is high and it's gone up significantly. For example, our Kenya case study found that the profitability of banks in 2002 were 70 million in total for the banking system. And in 2012, 10 years later, there were 1.2 billion. So the profitability of banks in Kenya had been growing at about 40% a year on average. Of course, the bank's universe had expanded and so on, but nothing to, to justify that. So the, the, the argument that there's more risk, it doesn't seem to be reflected in, in, the, profit, in the profitability. It's good, of course, that banks are profitable because you can increase the, if the money goes into strengthening bank capital, but it's bad because in a way there's a transfer from the rest of the economy to the financial sector. And there's research on Asia and Latin America uh, that shows that the higher the cost of credit, um, the less growth in, in agriculture and industry. Um, so this is, uh, and, and then there comes the big puzzle, because the, the, what standard economic theory would tell us that the inc that increase in competition and increase in the number of banks, for example, should lead to, to, to lower spreads. But competition is not so much less in, uh, in, in low-income countries than in other categories of countries, and the number of banks has increased quite significantly. Um, and this was a great frustration in Ghana, where we had our first workshop. Uh, you know, policymakers, academics were saying, we've doubled the number of banks, and spreads have practically not moved. Um, then there's also the issue of technological improvement. And I think one of the attractiveness on um, PESA is that it actually does seem to deliver, uh, in, in, particularly in other sorts of operations, lower costs. Um, and but more as a compensation. So I think there there is a there is a sort of research and policy puzzle. What should be done? Uh, some countries like Kenya have started to take action, 
they, the, the central bank and the Ministry of Finance have fixed the common reference rate. And if banks charge a spread above that reference rate, they have to justify it. And this may be a value, very valuable first step in terms of transparency, but also then possibly give policy tools. A third issue on this is, is maturity. We didn't look so much at that, but maturity of loans, again, has been identified, uh, particularly by our African stakeholders, as a key issue to fund infrastructure, agriculture, and industry. And I think there may be the two areas that, that could be highlighted. One, um, uh, how can pension funds, insurance companies, long-term institution investors uh, be mobilized to channel money in long term? And there are some successful cases, of course, um, including in, in middle-income countries like Chile and South Africa, others. How can lessons be learned from that? And secondly, can uh, public-private partnerships or institutions like well-run development banks play a role in uh, channeling more long-term money, both in infrastructure but in, in also in sectors like industry? So these are uh, issues that we address, but where we think that, that, that further, further work is needed. Uh, finally, um, um, there were two, two areas that we wanted to, to, to highlight. Um, one that I think came out, both of our empirical work, but also our analytical work, was there was a sense that uh, that more diversified financial systems are valuable. We have issues of size, large and small banks, uh, specialization, sectoral banks, either by sector of the economy or SMEs versus universal banks, uh, domestic versus foreign. And of course, within foreign, we have this very interesting new phenomena in Africa, which are the, the pan-African banks. Mm -hmm. Of, and, and, and international. And one of the things, because we were looking at the cost of credit, we found that the Pan-African banks were actually the ones that charged lowest spreads. Not, not in, by a great deal, but they did charge somewhat lower spreads, according to a study by the, the World Bank, than either foreign foreign banks from outside the region or national banks. In terms of mixture of private and public, uh, either institutions or mechanisms, and, and here we're talking about good, well-run development banks, which is quite a challenge, I think, in, in low-income countries. So the, the vision that we, that, that we came out with was the diversification of the financial system can, produce, uh, can reduce systemic risk. That if you have uh, financial institutions that have different uh, risks, um, and you, people think about this within institutions, you know, uh, Private banks talk about diversified uh, portfolios within institutions, but one can also think, I think, more broadly about diversifying across institutions, having large and small banks, uh, foreign and domestic, uh, may actually reduce systemic risk, so it may help with financial stability. It can serve better the needs of different customers. So, for example, smaller banks or more decentralized banks will know their customers better, will be particularly valuable for financing SMEs, whereas large banks will be much better at financing large corporate customers, including international firms. And finally, more healthy competition, maybe, could be introduced by a, a more diversified financial system. Um, and on the challenges of financial regulation, um, I think uh, one very important positive lesson is that low-income countries in Africa have actually had hardly any crisis in recent years, which is very positive, Nigeria being a, an exception, but it wasn't even there such a big crisis. But there's always, when you don't have a crisis, there is a, a, a risk of complacency, as we know. And so, so the good financial regulators in Africa shouldn't sleep on their laurels because we've seen in other areas, regions, that that doesn't work. Then there's the interesting challenge of adjusting very complex international regulations to country characteristics. And we did some interviews. Our, our colleague, Ricardo Gochak, went and talked to different regulators, and this is an important issue on how you should adjust these complex uh, international rules, many of which are very good, but which are more suited to 
uh, banking systems in de more developed or middle income countries. And finally, one point that, that we tried, uh, we stressed a lot because we did some additional empirical analysis about the point I made before about how whilst you're wanting to deepen, you want to ac avoid excessive rapid growth of credit, especially linked to property booms. There is a sort of rule that people like uh, Charles Goodhart, the guru of British financial regulation, will always tell you that uh, loans linked to property booms tend to be always either at the heart or an important cause of crisis. And there is a tool which, uh, which the international community has developed called macroprudential regulation, counter-cyclical regulation, but it needs to be adjusted uh, to the features of, um, of uh, low-income countries. And the skill sets also need to be adjusted because, of course, uh, traditional financial regulation was very focused on individual banks. And this is, of course, very important. But you need to also then link it to the macroeconomy. And, and linking it to the macroeconomy uh, and to potential shocks, say on the capital flows sides or on the commodity price side, um, means another set of skills uh, looking at the financial sector as a whole and its interactions with the, with the macroeconomy. So um, mm -hmm. I, 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 and a final point is that the implication of comprehensive regulation, which has become very important in a G20 context, has to be again adapted to the needs and features of LICs. So for example, how should, it's not about how you regulate derivatives so much, uh, or how you de regulate uh, shadow banking, as people talk in, in, say, US or UK, but how you regulate PESA, or how you regulate credit to consumers by non-financial institutions in a, in a comprehensive way, but also in a proportional way. And, and very much within that, and this is my very last point, is um, how, how you regulate currency mismatches, which is, uh, of course, uh, an experience that we have from previous crises. Uh, this is how you do that, whether you do it through domestic financial regulation or if you have to combine it with capital account management issues. Um, and, and this is, I think, an important challenge, which, of course, you have highlighted uh, quite rightly for, mm -hmm. for the next call. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, Stephanie, thank you very much. That's been very helpful. And uh, so a, a lot of um, policy issues in here, a lot of research issues in here, uh, just in terms of policy issues like the uh, you pointed to the importance of, uh, of, uh, of the availability of credit, um, also at the speed at which this is being uh, increased, that's important. Um, but not just the, um, the availability of credit, but also the terms under which this credit is, is, is available, so the cost of credit, mm -hmm. that is really important. And these are very uh, pertinent policy questions, not just in the finance world, but also in the development world, uh, when you move to, um, to for example, the, um, the, 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 the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Abeba, where, uh, where, of course, a lot of attention will be focused on, on public flows, uh, domestic and international, but also private flows. And so th fixing these issues about the availability but also the cost of credit is going to be really important to, uh, to achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, and the other area that you, you highlighted, the other policy area that you highlighted in your last slide, for example, is about uh, appropriate regulation, which needs to be taken up by the G20, uh, both in terms of, uh, sort of the, I think, the Basel uh, rules, but also um, uh, some of the other areas, such as uh, regulating MEPESA. Um, and these are also important issues in the, in the development community that need to be taken forward. And, of course, um, uh, also there's a research agenda moving forward as well, um, sort of highlighting some of the issues, I think, that are also mentioned uh, by John and Craig uh, just previously. Um, okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, move to the next uh, ground holder. And uh, uh, Andrea Nova, uh, I mean, you've done one paper on, uh, um, uh, on this ground, which, which it asks a question about why do African countries uh, or African banks lend so little? And I think that's a very important uh, question that we're also grappling with, uh, is, is that uh, the financial sector uh, might be growing um, in, in some areas, uh, maybe not enough in other areas, but uh, uh, it's growing fast in the UK and, uh, um, and in other countries. But both in developing countries and developed countries, sometimes it's not actually lending to the real sector either. It's not really lending uh, uh, for a long-term infrastructure, uh, for, for, for productive enterprises, and that's a big problem. So that Af actually African banks don't lend very much. So that, that I would be really interested to hear from you uh, on your research, uh, what you found, and uh, 
uh, and in particular that paper, but also the other areas that, that you've looked at. So over to you. Well, I would like to start uh, similarly by uh, thanking Dirk and ODI for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about the project, our findings, and also ESRC and DFID for uh, finding uh, the, the project and the research agenda. Um, the, uh, the, the head slide gives you the title of uh, the project, is the Politics, Finance and Growth. and. Um, uh, you will see from, from my talk that it's uh, complementary to uh, Stephanie's uh, in that it kind of cover it, it gives a flavor of these different methodologies that perhaps all three of us are going to be talking about. So what I chose to do for this talk is to focus on three specific outputs that we already have. There are, there are more, but I will highlight the three outputs we have. And um, I will start by... Uh, just giving a summary of the project. These are very uh, uh, broad aims that we had, and within each of those three um, points, we had uh, specific work marked up, ma mapped out. But I just want to say that um, what the kind of areas we were concerned with is obviously from the title of the project is linkages between politics, finance, and growth. And we had the um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in mind with a focus on the low-income countries. So the three areas we um, uh, wanted to uh, focus were to analyze causes of financial underdevelopment using theoretical models and also uh, empirical methods. Uh, we wanted to re-examine the um, finance growth uh, nexus so the key aspects with uh, special focus on bank, bank distress and financial fragility in the uh, low-income countries especially. And um, we also wanted to uh, look at the relationship uh, more closely between financial development and poverty in, uh, in league countries. Again, using different approaches and data. So um, in this um, research project, we had a uh, um, different expertise, but probably mostly from kind of broad section of economists um, rather than um, more in the disciplinary. Um, so the other uh, members of the team are Professor Baltachi from Syracuse, Professor Hall from Leicester, like myself, Professor uh, Peter Rousseau from Vanderbilt and uh, NBR. So uh, Peter is uh, uh, Peter Rousseau is um, an economic historian as well as macroeconomist among us. Um, um, Professor Thorsten Beck, um, now formerly uh, formerly of Tilburg and now of uh, Cass Business School. Uh, Professor Stephen Koch of Pretoria, University of Pretoria. Professor Robert Lensing from uh, University of Groningen and Professor David Fielding from University of Otago. You can see that we are kind of spread uh, uh, around the globe. And I think that one uh, big advantage I uh, think of this, I see, is precisely that it gives us the opportunities to work on these uh, uh, issues, bringing uh, people and coming into contact with other researchers that perhaps we wouldn't have been so naturally coming into contact. So some of these links were forged over the past uh, uh, ESRC projects, um, and some were new. Uh, because I've, I will focus on three outputs, let me just mention that um, uh, three items um, that I will focus, you will see. But um, there are also uh, a couple of interesting outputs that uh, I feel I need to uh, uh, pay due. So one is the paper by Thorsten Beck and Associates uh, on finance and poverty evidence from India. So this is uh, under one of our objectives of looking at uh, financial development and poverty relationship. And um, there's a series of papers, but one of the working papers are um, uh, posted on the project website is by Robert Lensing and uh, co-author on financial liberalization and income inequality channels and cross-country evidence. Um, now, th what I would like to talk about is this um, question that Dirk highlighted already in the introduction is, um, why do African banks lend so little? That's uh, one of the working papers that is now out in Oxford Bulletin uh, this year. 
so with um, uh, Buddy Baltachi, uh, Panikos Dimitriadis, and um, David Fielding, we uh, try to explain the apparent uh, mystery of excessive liquidity of um, African uh, of the African banking sector. Um, so this is well documented, and um, our question was. Um, precisely why is there so much liquidity? What could explain it? So we looked at the, um, our contribution here is to look at how the quality of institutions and the extent of moral hazard uh, can combine to determine the type of equilibrium in the loans market, so explain um, why there is um, insufficient lending. And the key feature in our explanation was variation in the quality of contract enforcement. So uh, specifics are there on the slide that um, the theory uh, model was devised uh, adapting the industrial organization model of banking. So we had the moral hazard uh, in the form of strategic loan default. Uh, we also had adverse selection separately um, to check our findings, um, which were manifested by the lack of good projects. Then uh, the predictions of the theory were taken to the data and um, using dynamic panel estimations. Now the result is the, uh, what Dirk was after, is that uh, loan defaults are the major factor um, which inhibits bank lending. And it's particularly uh, important for the low income countries because our, our key novel feature in this work was the institutional quality, the contract enforcement quality. When the contract enforcement is low, then you, you, you see a lot of um, loan default. So perhaps um, that's, uh, when you think about it, it's not very surprising. When contract enforcement is poor, then you will see a lot more loan defaults. Um, the obvious policy relevance, of course, is that if you're able to improve the institutional infrastructure, the contract enforcement um, provisions, then you would be able to um, reduce the loan default and you'll be able to um, channel those savings to productive use. So improvements in quality of institutions which limit the risks uh, that, that banks face from bad loans can reduce the impact of loans default on, on lending. But our conclusion was that that is only relevant when quality is low to begin with. So we found the threshold effects uh, both in the theory and uh, in the empirical part of uh, our investigation, which are not dissimilar to the uh, macroeconomic literature. Um, so the second uh, the, the kind of com companion paper, if you like, which is a working paper of um, uh, the Munich working paper, is uh, looks to, to explain the loan defaults in Africa. If loan defaults are the inhibiting factor behind uh, not uh, channeling those savings into productive use, um, then let's try and look uh, deeper into the loan defaults, so into the explanations of the loan defaults. Um, so again, we um, looked at this both theoretically and empirically, and um, the uh, model again contains the varying levels of contract enforcement and also corruption. So we have the uh, quality of governance um, variable and indicators in the empirical section. Uh, we also have the different degrees of market segmentation. So this is captured through ethnic fractionalization. And our prediction there was that the um, um, one quite obvious that it high loan defaults are more likely when there is greater market segmentation or when contract enforcement is weak. That's not surprising. But perhaps slightly less obvious uh, conclusion we found uh, was this non-linearity uh, um, effect. So uh, there were some important non-linearities non in the interaction of market segmentation and contract enforcement on loan defaults. And what is meant here 
is, uh, or what I mean by this, is um, that the improvements in the quality of contract enforcement uh, could reduce loan default rates only when the contract enforcement problem is initially neither much more severe nor much less severe than the market segmentation problem. So um, we focused on, on Africa, but I would imagine that that is quite relevant for other low-income countries where ethnic fractionalization is uh, is present, you are uh, bound to have this interaction of poor institutions, market segmentation that inhibits um, uh, lending. Um, okay, so the third output, um, and this is something that uh, is going to be available for everybody to use at the end of our project, and the substantial effort went into uh, uh, gathering this new data set. Um, is uh, the data set that comes up with um, indicators of financial fragility. So we have a very broad coverage of 124 countries over the period 1998-2012. That includes uh, 48, it actually includes more, but there's good coverage for this 48 African countries. The raw data comes from Bankscope and um, I am not an empirical person myself, but anyone I heard using Bankscope data, they just uh, close their eyes in horror and want <laughs> to run away. So we've, we've put a lot of effort into cleaning the data and making sense of what's in there. But our uh, contribution here is that um, the total asset value in our data set is nearly five times as large as that in the previous data sets. And uh, also importantly, data set includes uh, not just commercial banks, which tends to be the case in most data, um, data sets of that kind, or looking at the, at, at the issues of financial uh, instability, but also cooperative banks, investment banks, Islamic banks, real estate and mortgage banks, and savings banks. So we felt that was important because even though the share of um, commercial banks in our sample was 67%, which you would think is kind of the largest uh, share of all other um, deposit taking and lending institutions. Nevertheless, the total share of assets was surprisingly small. It was only about 21% vis-a-vis, uh, for example, investment banks had 23% and um, real estate and mortgage banks had 32%, even though there were few of them, but they had a, a larger total share of assets. So we felt it was important to include them, and also not least because the recent financial crisis indicated that these are the areas where the problems tend to originate. Um, so our um, contribution here is that we, we uh, have eight different measures of financial fra fragility, which aim to capture different aspects of vulnerability of financial systems. So it probably is not a terribly clear slide. We'll put it online later. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the measures that what they are is um, uh, so th um, the eight measures is the capitalization. So th in this table, there are seven. Uh, is capitalization, which is defined as equity over total assets, asset quality as impaired loans over gross, uh, gross uh, loans, managerial efficiency is cost to income, earnings is net income to average total assets, um, one measure of liquidity, which is net loans to total assets, and the second uh, measure of liquidity is liquid assets to total assets, and uh, final one is risk exposure. Uh, which is net charge-offs uh, to average gross, uh, uh, gross loans. So the signs are perhaps a, a, little, a little bit easier to see. They're the expected effect on financial fragility, so whether it's uh, uh, positive or negative. And um, to illustrate that these are genuinely eight different measures, they don't capture the same thing necessarily. Here's a correlation table that shows very low correlations between them, mm -hmm. except perhaps for the, for the two measures of liquidity, the net loans and liquid assets, where there is a, um, um, just a higher figure. So um, to conclude, uh, we, the project is in the final stages, and now we have the 
the nearly final version of the data set, we are um, going to continue to uh, with with some of the work that we intended to um, uh, th this data database to be used for. So we have um, the uh, papers that we were thinking predicting crisis, predicting bank failure, explaining fragility, uh, bank spreads, finance and political economy, and uh, re-examining growth finance nexus uh, from the point of view of, well, with these fragility measures in, or in the presence of uh, financial fragility. Um, I would like to conclude. <laughs> okay. And, well, thank uh, you very much, Vedlana. That's been very, uh, very helpful as well. And I think it also illustrates a number of things. So first of all, also the range of partners that you've mentioned, and also mentioned Stephanie before, mm -hmm. also the, the range of partners that you're involved in. I think that, that really augments the, uh, um, the, 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 the research and the, um, the quality of the research, and, um, and that, that's really important. But also the, 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 you, you generate uh, new data, which is, can be really valuable, and we can sort of highlight that, uh, that a bit more, and we can begin to analyze that, which is, which is very, uh, very helpful. And also, you, you, you look at your research, uh, particular questions that have, a, that have policy relevance, and I think both of you are good illustrations. And in the last case, um, so you look at, at why do African banks lend so little, for example, is one, mm -hmm. one question. And, and if you then find that it's the, the high default rate, so that means that your project shouldn't go bust, uh, then that means you get more, you get more uh, loans going. Uh, but how do you get more, uh, uh, how, how do you get fewer defaults? Um, and you point to a number of reasons there, but one, is on contract contract enforcement as an important area for uh, for policy to focus on, um, and and back it up with uh, with with um, with um, a range of uh, econometrics. Um, so that's that I think is il illustrates sort of a good, is an illustrative of a good E S C project. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'm sure there will be questions on on these part this particular conclusion and also the, the type of research that you you engaged in. Um, but let's go to the the, the third um, speaker and. Um, and you're, you're not in the same position to offer us new uh, new findings, uh, I suppose. That maybe you have some uh, already some some interesting uh, sort of research questions and hypotheses to to test, and uh, so it will be really interesting to hear from you uh, how you're getting on. Great, thank you, Dirk. And I'm conscious we've all been sat here for most of the afternoon, so I'll keep it short. Uh, we started our project six weeks ago, um, so we're six weeks in. So it's much more about the hypotheses and the questions and the motivation for our research rather than. Um, the findings, and it's wonderful to have uh, heard from Stephanie and Svetlana as well, because I think I'm sure we'll build on both of your research to date. So I'm a political scientist, um, and we're part of a uh, multidisciplinary team working on really global banking regulation and low-income countries. Um, so I'm based at the Blavatnik School of Government, and in a research program that looks at the political economy of global governance, um, global economic governance in its various forms, and particularly concerned about where developing countries and how sort of interface with that, be it trade, investment, or finance. Um, I think you've already mentioned, Stephanie, banks obviously dominate the financial landscape in many um, low-income countries, so global banking regulation was the obvious place to start. And um, just to talk you through very quickly here, global banking standards in the wake of the financial crisis, we've seen a whole lot of new banking standards set um, by the Basel Committee on Banking Standards. That's the picture there of their headquarters. Um, 27 countries in the room, none are low-income countries. Um, as Stephanie mentioned as well, the, the idea there is to improve financial stability, um, and so many of the, the aims are very laudable from a low-income country perspective. These standards are voluntary, um, but there is growing emphasis on worldwide adoption. And clearly, low-income countries need effective regulation financial, for financial stability and inclusive growth, and Stephanie's project's done a lot to th help us think about what that might look like. Um, and the interesting question with regard to the Basel standards is that they're incredibly complex. They're designed with advanced um, economies in mind. Um, so the typical sort of UK, US, um, and some of the larger emerging markets. Now, while, although they're, they are voluntary, and I'll show you some of the data we've got at the minute, um, low-income countries are moving to adopt these standards. Um, and at the same time, we have a lot of research emerging from um, a series of researchers questioning their appropriateness and their applicability in a low-income country context. Some of the concerns there around, especially you already mentioned, the macroprudential one, so the, whether they're properly calibrated to a low-income country context, but also some gaps. Um, so, for example, at the moment, we've seen the rise of pan-African banks. There's very little in the Basel framework that thinks about regionally systemically important banks. The emphasis is either on the global um, or on the national. Um, and then there's questions as well about the complexity of, given the complexity of these regulations, the regulatory capacity. 
Um, so our project really probes the political economy of banking regulation. Um, so there's two research questions that are overarching. How much de facto flexibility? So de jure, low-income countries don't need to um, implement these standards. In practice, what our initial research is showing is there is quite a bit of pressure on countries to adopt them. Um, and that's what we're probing. So how much de facto flexibility do they have? How much do they need? And under what conditions should uh, low-income countries adopt these new standards? And then thinking once we've established that, how do, the, do we reshape global financial standards to better reflect the needs of low-income countries? Um, our project is led from the University of Oxford, so Nairi and myself, and then with Thorsten Beck. Um, who's also been collaborating with Svetlana. So we're the, the, co the, pro the core project team, and we have a team of researchers based all over the place. And I've put all the, the currencies up, and I hope I'm going to get them right. So we have three researchers based in West Africa, Francophone West Africa, looking at um, Togo, Burkina Faso, and Côte d'Ivoire, um, and particularly sort of UEMOI, the politics of banking in the UEMOI um, group. Ghana, where I'll be working with a researcher in the central bank um, in Ghana. Um, I think that's Angola, that should be. Um, a colleague in Oxford working with um, a low income, sorry, a, an Angola based uh, think tank. Tanzania, Kenya, and um, where am I? And Uganda. Um, and we have colleagues, one based in IDS in uh, Kenya and another based in LSE working on that project together with Thorsten Beck. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a cluster of countries in Southeast Asia, so Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos, and we have two researchers based in the Fulbright University um, in Vietnam. Um, and in terms of disciplines, we've got lawyers, economists, and political scientists. Um, so that's the sort of the group. So just what I thought I'd do now is to give you a bit of a flavor of where we're at. So we've started research looking at the literature, and the first step of the project is to, one, establish how low-income countries are reacting. So with, how are they reacting to this set of standards? Are they implementing them? If so, which parts are they implementing? And then starting to think about what the hypotheses might be for that pattern of implementation. So we're going to start at the cross-country um, level and then do a series of case studies um, in these countries. Um, so we've started to cluster um, the data that we have. And here, very initial, we've done this in the last couple of weeks, um, based on the latest survey from the Financial Stability Institute that covers 88 countries. Um, and what we've, we've put them into four different clusters, these countries. First type one, no implementation. So no move on Basel II, Basel 2.5, or Basel III. So these, if you're not familiar with the Basel standards, are, have all developed over the last 10 years. And what you'll see is that quite a few low-income countries are in that, in that cluster. But we also have some that are then in type two, this sort of partial implementation where they've made moves on Basel II, and then what we've called type three, which is partial implementation on Basel II, but also 2.5 and 3, which are the very latest standards. And then we've got a group we're calling high implementation, um, which is really implementation across the board, including the more sophisticated aspects of Basel II. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, there's very few low-income countries there. Um, but what you do see from this graph, right, there's a quite a variation across our low-income countries. Um, and it, when you look at the granularity, it's, they are clearly taking very different approaches. So why might this be? Um, first obvious thought is maybe it's about financial depth. So low-income countries, they vary tremendously in their financial depth. At one end of the spectrum, we've got the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and if we measure financial depth, how have we done it with domestic credit to the private sector as a percentage of GDP? So again, pretty simple measure. We, we'll use more complex um, once. But one end, we've got the Dem Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, where that stat is 4%. The other end, we've got a low-income country of Vietnam, where it's above 100%, right? So one thought is, maybe this is about financial depth. But again, if we look here, so this is our type 1 countries, um, no implementation, and type 3 countries. And this is for all countries, whatever their income category. It's not, there, is a, there is a slight correlation, it looks like, with, or association there with financial depth, but it's by no means the whole story. Um, just quickly, because I'm conscious of time, um, there's a couple of countries stand out. So, for example, we have Ghana, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Uganda, who are at the bottom end here. Um, so, low financial depth, and um, sorry, close to the microphone. microphone. <laughs> they are um, so there's low financial depth, and they haven't made any move to implement. So that's as we might expect. Then we've got a series of countries. 
Um, we've got Vietnam, for example, where there's no ad adoption and yet a very high level of financial depth. And then we have countries like Liberia, Kenya, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, where they've already started to make moves. They're in type three. They've already started to make moves on the most sophisticated Basel III. Right? So it's kind of, it, it's not clear um, that this is driven by financial depth alone. So being political scientists, we thought politics might have something to do with it, which is where we're at now. Um, we're going to start working through a few different hypotheses. So now we'll start, we've sort of fleshed them out based on the literature. Um, and now we'll start instrumentalizing them and testing them. So the first hypothesis we're working with is institutional fit, um, which is basically the idea that the, you've got a new set of standards coming from the global arena, and let's think about what's already in place. The capacity question, but also the types of regulatory approaches and how close they are with what Basel um, sets out. Second one, powerful interest groups. We know that bank, different types of financial players are differently um, impacted. So for example, under Basel II, and I think this is work that Stephanie and others did in the early 2000s, show that domestic banks typically lose out under Basel II, particularly some of the um, ad advanced internal rating-based um, uh, uh, methods that are adopted, um, whereas international banks are of often benefit. So you can get different but players in the banking sector have a different um, distributive impact that comes out of these standards, so therefore we'd expect them to put pressures on regulators in different ways. Again, the Pan-African banks are really an interesting one. In West Africa, for example, we have Ecobank rapidly expanding, headquartered in Togo, which isn't, their home regulators aren't under, they're not in the Basel Committee, they're not adopting Basel III. Right? You have then European banks, particularly the Francophone banks, directly competing, that because their parent banks are France, they're in the Basel Committee, are adhering to Basel III. So I think we'll find some interesting politics depending on the home um, regulator there. We've been talking to um, regulators in low-income countries. One of the reasons for adopting seems to be signaling, particularly to uh, credit rating agency assessments take Basel into account when they um, make their assessment. So if you're trying to raise a bond on the international market, maybe adoption is something that you're thinking about to adopt in order to signal credibility um, to the international markets. Another um, hypothesis emerging from the literature and political science is diffusion through expert networks. Um, and just quickly, the fifth then is coercion, coercive pressure, and the idea that maybe it's conditionality from the IMF and World Bank. We've put that one in there because We've seen it in other areas of international economic relations. On this particular instance, the bank and fund are quite skeptical of the value of Basel um, III. So it's in there, but I don't think it's going to be the one that probably determines the results. So that's where we're at, six weeks in, um, with an ambitious project and an exciting one, I think. It's really to unpack the politics of this um, and sort of establish the trends across countries and then uh, within countries, and building very much from both of your work. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's been really excellent, and uh, um, I loved your slide with banknotes. It was really good, sort of, to indicate the spread of, uh, of, of the research, and uh, uh, so for a financially literate audience, I think that, uh, <laughs> that has been uh, really, really good. Um, also, the multidisciplinarity of the, of the research, which is really interesting as well, so it's not, not only economists that, uh, that, uh, that work on ESC grants, but it is, it, it is a range of, of disciplines that, uh, that are working on this, and of course, this is a very important area of, uh, of work that you're highlighting, so the, the Basel III regulation, and um, I suppose for developing countries, it would be a start if, if uh, the G20 themselves all adopted Basel yeah. III and, uh, uh, and more. Um, uh, but of course, there's then the discussions about uh, uh, low-income countries, and, and it's very interesting to sort of think through the determinants of this, and I would be very interested to see what, what is coming out of that research. Um, so um, we've got um, uh, uh, some time now for, uh, for some questions uh, to, to the panel. Uh, I thought we, we had a, a very nice range of, of research, mainly on the, on the, the macro side um, uh, of, of, the of the research, also sort of on going into the more detail in terms of the banks. Um, uh, less on the, on the microfinance uh, that's been covered by other, other grant holders. Um, but I think we had a nice spread of, re of research and also indicating the depth of the networks that they're all, all involved in and, uh, uh, and the approaches that, they, that they've highlighted, case studies, econometrics, uh, more political science, or sort of the range of approaches that are, that are available. So, so I think that's, that's been an excellent spread. Um, is, is there anybody who, who has questions uh, about, about the, 
the research. Very good. Um, okay. Maybe I, I, I take one or two questions, um, if, if possible, if there are questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, j really more of a comment than a question, if I may. And um, on Stephanie's uh, frustration with the wide persistence of widespread um, credit spreads uh, in, in the banking sector, and also Svetlana's um, research on um, the abundant liquidity, the mystery of abundance, uh, abundant liquidity in the banking system, um, and possible explanations being um, uh, enforcement, um, I inadequate enforcement of, of contracts uh, and um, high credit risk, you know, riskiness of, of, of projects, default risks, basically. Um, if, if you talk to the bankers in a lot of these countries, uh, they would also cite other reasons, and I'm, you may have come across them in your research, but maybe you haven't um, delved too much into them or you didn't find them uh, you know, credible enough. But actually, when you talk to them, they tell you other simple things, explanations for uh, that liquidity in, in, in the system. When we talk about liquidity, we really need to be clear that uh, when you look at the bank's balance sheet, it's, you know, you've got loans and you've got investments. And the investments mostly are government paper, you know, uh, short-term government paper. And why would a banker uh, lend to somebody, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's got aspirations, business aspirations, but cannot put together a proper business plan? You know, where is business education? Where is the help in actually um, uh, showing them how to negotiate a loan with a bank. Uh, the business case could be good, but they can't put it across properly. That's one simple reason, uh, business education. Um, the other is, um, you know, governments crowding out the, the, the smaller businesses because they're offering uh, bonds and, and, you know, commercial, um, sort of treasury bills at very high rates. So why would a bank worry about lending to smaller businesses who, A, can't put a business case across properly, uh, and you can't blame them for that, they need help. Um, and secondly, they cannot offer collateral that is um, fungible. Um, when a land, piece of land is owned by several family members or, or relatives, uh, how do you take, uh, you know, a mortgage on, on this, that means you're involving the rest of the family. Rwanda, for example, have gotten around this. I won't delve into that. Um, but, you know, simple things like that, that um, perhaps don't come out in the data, yeah. but they really are quite important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, you wonder about the, the lower um, uh, credit spread in, in, in um, uh, I think you mentioned Ethiopia. But there again, you know, in Ethiopia, they have this big dam project. And the, 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 the uh, uh, government uh, wanting social solidarity, essentially, are forcing both savers and the longer-term institutions like pension funds and, and, and insurance companies to hold these bonds at a very high negative interest rates. Um, so, um, you know, again, uh, there's, there's lack of demand uh, for finance as well as hmm. a lack of supply. So, so thank you. okay. Um, maybe we, if there are other questions, otherwise we can we can take this particular question um, on. Well, actually, it's more than link to this one. Yeah. To okay. So. If uh, any of you try to look actually at the demand side of finance, so or it's mostly like supply side of finance. So, I think the demand side could be examined through various firm level survey and all this say reasons, for example, being ref if you applied for loans and if you've been refused uh, um, loans. So uh, these uh, reasons like lack of collateral, for example, or lack of business education, they may come up there. Um, so did you try to look at the demand side of finance or not? Okay, okay. maybe take this. Oh, there's a third question. Yeah, yeah. also related. Um, well, um, and the high interest rates. Um, and uh, Africa certainly is uh, a cash-based uh, area, so uh, what are the alternative ways of, of raising capital? Uh, because capital is being raised, but not through the banks, possibly. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well maybe we can take these the, these questions. I think an, an important area of uh, of research and also for policy is is the interest rate spread. So because uh, interest rates are uh, the nominal interest rates are already high in uh, sort of the the central bank charges uh, is already high, but it might might be for different reasons. Inflation might be high, but then on top of that, there's an interest rate uh, spread that commercial banks might uh, might charge customers, and uh, and so that that difference that's called the interest rate spread that is. Uh, that tends to be higher in low-income countries, as Stephanie mentioned. Um, but of course, then the question is: is what what is behind that? And um, and, uh, and I think that is an, an important area for research. And you, you may want to sort of um, discuss a bit about what you, what, what you uh, um, what you think about the other other areas that, that are being mentioned. So, is the government crowding out the private sector? Is that one of the reasons for for the high interest rates? But what 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 could there be other reasons? Um, have you have you looked at these? And there could be other reasons. We didn't look at the survey data at all. We were, sorry. <laughs> um, the, 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 all the reasons you mentioned, or all, all the possible explanations, I, I agree that they have, the, they have the force, they have the validity. The um, collateral, especially, I suppose, an important one, but I suppose we were li limited by the data we had. We, as I said, we didn't have the survey uh, type data, so we could not examine the demand side as you say. However, in the, um, in the uh, theoretical modeling, we did um, look at the opportunity cost of uh, lending to a private uh, businessman. We didn't call it that, but financing a business project or uh, going for a safe um, uh, project. So uh, I suppose we, we, we had a those reasons packed away in that opportunity cost of lending, and it was the the riskiness to do with the default rates that that came up as the explanation. But I agree that there are there are other issues that uh, warrant examination. Um, in relation to uh, other alternatives to banks as raising funds, I think was your point. Again, we we looked at the bank scope data, so we we were. Um, interested to explain the excessive liquidity in the banks, which was um, twice as high as in high and medium income uh, countries. So that, that seemed, um, and again, you can, you can think uh, of different explanations, but we, and different institutions, uh, indeed, as you mentioned, but we didn't. We were looking at the excessive liquidity in the banking sector rather than alternative uh, lending institutions. Okay. And just, just briefly, um, because I think the question was more addressed to Svetlana. Um, I think it's very interesting what, what the, the points that you made, and it's good to talk to people. Um, I think the surveys, for example, that say the World Bank does of access to credit by categories of size and so on, of, uh, uh, and to what extent is access to credit a barrier? Um, I, I, I've always used them a lot. And then I, I, I was discussing with colleagues like Charles Harvey, who's been working on African banking for decades, even longer than me. Uh, and, and he said one thing, you know, when people ask uh, firms, you know, do you, do you, would you like more access to credit? Or does credit limit your, your growth? Uh, they they and they all they tend to say yes, but what the banker has to assess in defense of banker, I think, is quite an interesting point. Whether this company is credit worthy, I mean, also whether they prepare a good business plan, but whether they're actually credit worthy. So there the, there is this issue of how you meaningfully ask the questions, and I think that may be an interesting issue mm -hmm. for for further research. Is how from outside you find out. Uh, whether whether the banks are really failing, uh, as, as traditionally economists say, you know, uh, and to what extent those companies uh, have problems that can be dealt with through technical assistance, where uh, DFID or others uh, can help, or or whether maybe they're, they're, they're really not not very trustworthy, or whether it's the kind of problems that Svetlana was talking about in terms of um, you know uh, difficulty to enforce enforce contracts and so on. I think also an interesting issue would be to look at, it just occurs to me now, uh, between, say, 
public development banks and private ones. Because traditionally, I think public development banks, one of their problems in the past has been that they couldn't get the money paid back. And is that, was that for difficulties of, of loan enforcement and so on? Or, or were there other back reasons? Projects. Were there back projects or was there a sort of soft budget mm -hmm. attitude? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also in terms of improvement. So I think these are really, this is, you've opened up a, a really rich um, set of questions. Mm. So what are, are they playing the sort of the financial intermediary role that they should be exactly. playing, uh, the allocation role, so that there's a lot of finance is available and there are a lot of projects that want to have the finance. Exactly. There needs to be an, an intermediary body that, that does that in an efficient exactly. way. And I think that is that is really important also for the the wider finance for development discussions is uh, it, it, it's very often not a shortage of funds that that um, that, that constrains the achievement of the uh, of of the uh, development yeah, goals, yeah. The development goals. But it is it is the ability to mobilise the finance, to channel the finance, and to use the finance effectively. Um, that, that that is that is very important, and, and, and there's, there's a yeah. sort of a whole range of, of research that that is that, that can be undertaken on on sort of empirical basis on, the, on what types of policies are, are needed mm -hmm. to mobilize the research, what types of institutions are needed, to, what, what types of policies mm -hmm. and institutions are needed to sort of uh, uh, think about um, uh, how finance can, um, can, can, uh, can help the diffusion of technology, for example, the, mm -hmm. the, the third bullet point in, uh, in the text that John was, uh, was outlining. Very good. Um, Sadia. Yeah, I would like to... Don? I would like to congratulate uh, all these researchers, all economists, all women also. I can realize mm. there's a gender bias in this <laughs> <laughs> And a bit younger than me. Um, I had uh, one technical question for the two papers about to be published, and I'm looking forward to it. And something I would like to discuss about uh, 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 the future. In the two papers, one question for Stephanie. Uh, the spread that you mentioned mm -hmm. was were spread in local currency, isn't it? Mm. Um, in my long experience, I have seen some fishy stuff in banks going around the spread in local currency versus the spread in dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, managing your liabilities and assets in your banks in order you, you are ready to make a sacrifice or to overcharge your spread in local currency, provided that you can, let's say, manage your, uh, your hard currency, especially if you are a subsidiary of a foreign bank in a way that you can take it out of the country very quickly. So I don't know if you can, with mm. your researchers, look at this. My question also about uh, the Svetlana was uh, something she said, sorry, uh, something she said that struck me was, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, was a a point, or I'll come back to you because I can't remember, but there was something which struck me. Now, what I'm interested in is that in terms of uh, the, the, the economic, economic science, uh, I don't know if it is a social science, but uh, they, sometimes the economists, we are moving towards behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And in terms also, I think, uh, uh, in terms of regulation, mm -hmm. there are some, 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 some things at play. And one thing which struck me, I'm just coming back from uh, a seminar organized by the World Bank on funding agriculture finance, and there were many central bankers and bankers. And for instance, they don't, they are not at ease to work with agriculturists and farmers and people in rural areas. And we have dozens of anecdotes. When you are a banker and a young banker, you want to remain to work at the kind of headquarters and have your suits and your tie in air conditioning offices, and you don't want to take your wellies to go in the mud and visit the projects. Uh, you don't want to engage with people who are not exciting for your career path. You don't want to, to deal with the kind of, uh, the, 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 reason. The, the, the kind of, uh, I would say, non-scientific and non-economic dimensions of doing banking. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know if Svetlana has seen this a little bit in, in her past research, and if you are going to take this into co consideration for the regulatory dimension of, of this also, the role of headquarters versus mm -hmm. people in agencies, and the role of those who are going to deal with the cooperative banks, the microfinance banks, the kind of bottom of the parent banks, 
and those who are going to deal with their career path if they want one day to move from their own central bank to the IMF or the World Bank as a senior officers. And that is quite something we see as practitioners. Thank you. Okay. I think Victor, was also, you, yeah. you had your hand up as well. Yeah. So maybe. Thank you. Um, j just two uh, uh, quick questions. One um, to um, uh, uh, Svetla and uh, Stefan and Rosotti. Did, did you have a feel on how competitive these banks are? Uh, the, 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 the banks that um, you, know, you are looking at? Uh, because we see clearly that they are highly profitable. Um, we see also that they have you know, a kind of you know, high spread, as Stefan said. But I just wanted to see whether you have a feel on their, you know, competitiveness, um, especially, you know, the growth of so many banks, growth of uh, cross-border banking across Africa, which is in both the south, the east, and the west, uh, Morocco, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. Just wanted to, you know, to see, you know, um, what your research is pointing to. Possibly Emily has not gone this far if she has it in terms of your... The second is uh, the, uh, the, the, the question I had before was about the data, and I'm glad that Svetlana came to say that um, they have put together this fantastic database. Now the question is, uh, you know, um, is it available now, or when it's will it be available, um, or when? And on that particular data, um, first of all, I was impressed to find, you know, 48, um, you know, African countries. Um, I've never been able to get to 48 countries even at the African Development Bank when we were constructing this. <laughs> so the reason why uh, we couldn't do it at the bank with the, such a huge department was um, of fragility. Um, some, if you, there are 55 countries in Africa, including the islands. So if we remove some countries which are fragile, they have been in war since for a long time, um, it's very difficult to get for it. Having said that, I think I should give you the benefit of the doubt and look at the data and see you know, how many data points you have on some of these. But I, I, I would want to know when the data will be you know, out and what will be. And on that particular question, um, uh, Stephen, are, are you, uh, do you have um, a database that will be available from your research? Or is it just uh, an open question? Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so I've got two, type, two questions. Uh, maybe we go to Svetlana first, and then Stephen, and maybe you should. Okay, so the behavioral economics question, I'm not sure it's directed to me, but presumably to all of us. Uh, I, f I find it very amusing um, that the career concerns of young bankers would influence the lending on the ground. We didn't have the data to look into it, but it's certainly something that is very interesting to investigate further. Um, and I would imagine survey data is much more uh, useful in answering these questions. How? widespread this is, to what extent it influences lending, very interesting. Um, in relation to the data set, I think in terms of how competitive the banks are, we didn't look into this uh, issue, it's perhaps more a uh, question to Stephanie. The data set uh, will be available at the end of the project, so by March next year, as one of the outputs with full documentation of the how the data was extracted, how it was, how the indices were constructed. Um, the bulk of the data comes from data uh, from bank scope. So this is the per bank data that is self-reported by the banks to uh, Bureau Van Dyke, and in that um, sense. Um, you know, the, the banks choose, it, it's self-reporting, so they come into the database, they leave the database. We obviously respect the property, properties of the data and we look at the, um, we have um, selection rules which are also explained in the paper um, that complements the database, how um, we keep the banks, what criteria they need to, to <coughs> satisfy. Um, but on the issue of um, how that interacts with the fragility of the state, we haven't specifically looked at. I guess the proviso is what I already stated, that this, uh, this, the, all the data are self-reported by banks. They have the, it, it's what they choose to do, whether they choose to be in the data set of bank scope or whether they stop reporting for whatever reason. 
So the, uh, the data set as, as it is, our data set, is aggregated per country on the, um, uh, those banks that are reporting with specific selection rules that are discussed in the paper at length. You have to take it with a grain of salt, I suppose, as uh, any data set. Can, so, excuse me, Chair, can I for a um, I'm familiar with banks of data, and the question here is also a short one. How do you control for um, uh, inflation and specifically uh, exchange rate changes if you put together such an enterprise? In our indicators? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is for bank. I think we control, but I'm not sure. I have to defer to the paper to, to look up the You can maybe connect afterwards yeah. on that mm -hmm. particular question. No, I remember the question. It was just being your whole economy. <laughs> <laughs> that is, sorry, I remember the question. That This is something we see when we do uh, financial diaries or household surveys. This is the length. Uh, between the la latest crisis that uh, mm. uh, users of financial services have witnessed, and the kind of uh, uh, the kind of time it takes for them to forget mm -hmm. the previous crisis, so can are you planning to do this kind of research in terms of why this high liquidity, depending on how long was the previous crisis in the banking sector, when these banking sectors uh, suddenly had to face in the past? Uh, liquidity uh, kind of uh, shortages or freezes. Mm -hmm. That was my question. And uh, this kind of institutional memory which remains prevalent into these financial systems. That's, called, in the, that's a very important in the literature, it's called disaster myopia. So mm -hmm. the longer you haven't had a crisis, the, the less you worry about. <laughs> we haven't specifically planned to look into it, but now we will. <laughs> 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 we still have time and we have data sets so we will. Mm. Very good. Well, Farkin Diffit and ESRC have foresight, so they, they <laughs> fund research. <laughs> Very good. Uh, you wanted to come in as well? Or? Yep, sure. Very briefly on the behavioral economics um, point, I think it's an excellent one. And actually, so I'm a political mm -hmm. scientist and we've got, there's a lot of work in political science that looks at behavioral um, decisions. And the point of the communication between the banker and the rural farmer is one dimension. It's, um, I think we might well pick up on that. But what we definitely will look at is whether the, that works at the international level, where if a regulator or central bank governor is part of an international network, they're more likely to then want to signal to their peers mm. right, from a higher income countries that we're adopting best practice. Mm. And we've seen some of that in the emerging economies. So there is, there is some political science research that has shown that if you are part of that integra integrated Basel network, you're more likely to adopt high levels of standards. Um, the second point there was just on the career path. Um, there's one point which is the career path from the central bank into the IFIs, but the other point is, which we've seen in the UK and other advanced uh, economies, is the revolving door phenomenon, mm. where you're going between the central That's bank right. and Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or wherever. So mm. I think, again, we can expect those kind of relationships to play out. And we're certainly attuned to that, and, and we'll be looking at it. Um, so the ph phenomenon of regulatory capture. Um, again, I know there's one country um, where there's the president's daughter owns the bank, so therefore it's very difficult for the bankers to regulate, right? So again, each country will be specific for some of the political dynamics and how they affect um, regulatory decisions. On the survey data point, um, wasn't directly addressed to me, but I think it's something that we're very cognizant of, because to try and get at some of these regulatory decisions across countries, we want to run a survey of regulators to pick up on perceptions. Um, but I think I'll touch base with both of you on how we design that survey, because again, how we frame it and ask the regulators, obviously conditions the type of responses we're likely to get. Okay, you want to just, come just very, very quick, quickly. I wanted to say that uh, we have done um, partial a survey of the regulators. We did it a long time ago with uh, Ricardo mm -hmm. Gochak when, when Xavier hired us, when he was a DFID. And, and more recently, as part of this project, Ricardo Gochak talked to a number of regulators in, in LIC countries and came out with different perspectives. For example, on do they prefer Pan-African banks or do they prefer foreign foreign banks from outside the region? Some countries regulators, surprisingly the Ethiopians, who's supposed to be like more, if you like, left wing, they actually prefer really foreign banks, British and American, because they feel they, they bring new things to the table. 
whereas a number of the other African regulators that he surveyed, that he went to talk to in their countries, uh, actually said that they prefer Pan-African banks because he, he felt they bring new products, uh, they may be cheaper, and so on. So that, that was a very interesting area. So we, we tried to do more qualitative things. We didn't do so much new data sets, Victor. We also did a couple of um, literature reviews, one on capital flows. And we found that the, the literature on capital flows for LICS, which was done here at ODI, Isabella Massa, was actually um, very poor. Mm -hmm. the, the, the literature on capital flows uh, on LICS is very poor compared to the extensive literature, of course, on middle income and high income. And then Stephen Spratt did a very comprehensive literature focusing more on the domestic uh, financial regulation. I mean, just two very, very quick um, points. Um, on, um, I mean, I, I wanted to comment on the point that, that Dirk made. I think he, he very centrally said, you know, what a financial sector should be about. So, and, and I think that's a very important way of measuring how well a financial system performs, these functions of encouraging and keeping safe savings, um, intermediating them at a, a relatively low cost, and channeling them to efficient uh, investment. And I think that, that one has to kind of keep that in mind all the time when you're evaluating, because one tends to sometimes get a bit lost in, 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 in details. Uh, and then, therefore, that's why we kept emphasizing, you know, availability of credit, like you did, cost of credit, maturity of credit. And maybe thinking more creatively about <coughs> what are the institutions, what are the case studies in lakes, outside, uh, in, in other areas, which deliver those and which ones don't. So I think we have to kind of, uh, if, if the methodology, if, if the data allows us to answer that in very kind of microeconometric work rate, but if, 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 if it doesn't, then maybe one has to be a bit more broader looking. Um, I mean, this stuff about wearing wellies and, and going to the countryside, um, I think there's also the whole issue about, uh, I was reading a, a paper by Lema Senbet, we, which looks at why, for example, in certain lake countries, um, you know, uh, lending is more inclusive. And he concludes, rather obviously, but proves it econometrically, that those countries which have more branches in mm -hmm. different regions, including in poorer regions, tend to then, of course, get better access to, to poor people. And I think that's very interesting. I mean, I've had these discussions in India, and in India, if a foreign bank wants to come into the country, mm. one of the conditions that the central mm. bank puts is that you shouldn't just be in Delhi and Mumbai, but that you need to go into the region. So this kind of kind of quite simple uh, regulatory approach may, may, may be of interest in that sense. OK, time's up, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid. Very good. Um, so um, uh, let's uh, uh, recap. Um, uh, first of all, um, there are a range of, uh, of people here who can help you out with the research call. So there's uh, ears of C and Diffit, but particularly ears of C, who, uh, who are still sitting here. And, uh, and uh, you can speak to them now or call them later. Um, you can also visit our website. Um, and quite soon, I think there will be a report. So there's Caroline and Sarah are, uh, are sitting at the back who, uh, who are working at the TUGRP Evidence and Policy Group here at ODI, who, who, um, who can also help you point to uh, Point you to uh, what, what, what's already out there uh, if you want to have an overview, uh, for example, or mm -hmm. if you want to um, uh, get access to, to these type of publications, uh, just send us an email. Um, uh, Louise is also uh, there to, to, to help out as well, um, uh, and uh, for example, on, on impact or, or other areas. Um, we're happy to help out as well if, uh, if, uh, if needed. Um, but, uh, but finally, I'd like to thank uh, the speakers, uh, so EGC and DFID, of course, um, for their, uh, for their uh, efforts, um, and uh, so often behind the scenes, but uh, that's really important. But also the grant holders for, uh, for uh, so coming here and to discuss uh, sort of examples and, and really uh, pr proving the point that it's uh, sort of the, that there's, there's relevant research out here, high quality research and journal articles uh, and so on, but also that they, these that you discuss. Uh, highly relevant uh, uh, questions that are relevant for, for policy as well. So that, that's what we, we'd, we'd like to see. So um, a big thank you uh, for, uh, for you all. <laughs> <laughs>